Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. We make a line of hand saws here, five different ones, but I offer a premium saw that has a beautiful wood handle, several varieties. I make these myself, and I'm going to show you how I do it. I'm Rob Cosman, and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help you take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and don't forget to turn on the notification on your mobile device so you'll know every time we release a new video. Good? All right, back to the bench. These are the saws that we produce right now, and we can get them in either color. Dovetail saw, the fine crosscut saw, we call it the joinery crosscut, bench crosscut, a little heavier saw, a medium tenon, this is what most folks would use for cutting tenons on what I would call house furniture, and then a larger tenor, tenon with a deeper um, ability to cut. Well, as we got going and we were selling lots of saws, there was a demand out there for a nice fancy wood handle. Not just a run of the mill, but something really pretty. And I started to do that. I actually make these myself. I'm gonna show you some of the woods that we're using. And one, tonight we're gonna use, or on this video, we're gonna use this one. This is a piece of king wood with a little bit of sap and it has some beautiful purple color in there. Nice and nice, good weight to it. Here's a piece of koa from Hawaii. Here's a piece of um, uh, zakote. And this, I, I call this landscape wood because of the way that it looks like a landscape. This is a piece of madrone burl, which will really light up with a finish on it. This is one of my favorites. This is a uh, vera wood. Uh, we call it super dave wood. And this is the, this beautiful emerald green color, just gorgeous stuff and really good weight. Here's some snake wood, which I believe is listed as the most expensive exotic wood that you can find. Great weight to it, polishes beautifully. Here's a piece of Macassar ebony, and I've never had Macassar with that many streaks of uh, tan in it. Here's a piece of uh, Gaboon ebony, and I don't normally find it with white streaks in it, but that'll make an interesting piece. This is some uh, Bastogne walnut, a lot lighter, but has some beautiful figure, and uh, that makes a gorgeous handle. Coca Bolo, although the dust is toxic, when it's polished up, it's, uh, it's beautiful. And pink ivory, this is the natural color of the wood. Absolutely fantastic stuff, extremely expensive, however. Now the downside to working with exotics is you don't always know what condition you're getting it, meaning how well it's been dried. Here's a piece of um, uh, moon ebony, and as you can see, it is checked so bad and twisted that I could never get a handle out of that. But it would have been a real interesting one had I been able to. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the process of making a king wood handle. We're gonna try to grab a little bit of this sap wood up in the top of the horn, make it a little more interesting. And I'm gonna take you through the process to where we can actually test that saw and see how well it cuts at the end. Now I made my template out of plexiglass the reason is so I can put it on there and I can see what grain I'm going to get with the handle. Now, this is a, this wood that I've got comes from a good friend of mine down in Southern California, Ahmed. And I don't know where he finds it, but he supplies us with some of the prettiest stuff I've seen. And I want to include some of this sap. I'd like to get a little bit on the top and a little bit on the bottom, but I don't think I can. There's just a little bit there and it's not going to reach. But we want to make sure that the grain running right through here is parallel to this line give it lots of strength. I also want to be able to get two out of it so as not to waste so I can put two in there and I've got, I've got lots of room to get two so as long as I stay towards one side. So what I think I'll do there I'm going right straight across and I get some sap wood on the top. That looks to look good. So there's no reason to uh, move it around at all. I still have lots of room to come in and get one out of here. I can actually get some on the bottom. So I'll do it right there. Now my blank needs to be a full one inch. And the fact that these are already dimensioned is nice. You see exactly what you got and you know what you're gonna have for grain. My biggest contrast here is going to be between the sapwood and the heartwood and the nice color of the purple kingwood. I'll use a pen or pencil, whatever shows up best. And if I have to, I'll put some masking tape on the wood so I can see even better. I 
All right, now over to the bandsaw. Now the outside radius is a really easy to handle. It's the inside radiuses, uh, or the ones that you can't get at with something like a disc sander, you'll see what I mean, that are more difficult because I've got to do them with a small diameter spindle sander and, and try to make that radius, uh, make that curve perfect so there's no bumps in it. Now I had to put a piece of one inch MDF on here because in order to get this nose piece, I've got to be able to swing over top of this. And if you're laying on the table, you bump into it. Just a light touch. So this is an oscillating spindle sander. As that turns, it also goes up and down so that you get to use more of the uh, sandpaper instead of wearing out one spot. I'm gonna start with a coarse grit and just go in and shape it. Uh, then I'm gonna go to a medium and then a final finished grit on this surface and on that surface. The rest of these are going to be shaped with the router, but these two can be finished here. This is the part you got to get the hang of because I've got to be able to make the transition from that inside curve, which is easy to do because it's essentially the shape of this of the uh, spindle, but then where it meets this is a little bit tougher. The reason it's so tough to do an outside curve is you've only got a small point of contact. Now it's a process of working through the grits to bring this to a nice polish and that section. So this has gone from 120, this is a 180, and I'll finish off with a 320. All the shaping's been done with the heavier grit, so now I just have to go in and remove the scratches from that shaping grit. Okay, that's off the 320. That'll polish up nicely. Now I just noticed that there's a little bit of a snipe mark on both sides of this blank, so I don't want that to interrupt. So I'm gonna go over the disc sander and I'm just gonna flatten these two faces but I don't want to take too much material off because I want it to remain uniform thickness throughout, and I need to check that as well. So the closer I am to one inch, the better. Everything I have set up is designed to work on one inch, so that's just five thou over. That's about three thou over. And that's right on, so I won't take much off, just enough to get two nice flat surfaces. Now the problem with routing this is at some point you're going to be going against the grain. And on certain woods that's almost fatal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower the bit and I'm going to do this in possibly three different stages. If you're 
bit's not sharp, you got to keep uh, you keep moving, or else you even stop for a second or part of a second, and it'll burn. Now this is almost complete, but what it'll allow me is one final pass to take the slightest material amount of material off, and that'll take care of any burns. I don't enjoy having my hands that close to a router, but I guess you got to do what you got to do. I've tried to come up with an idea on making it safer, but perhaps that's the reason why I'm the only one that does this. I'm just checking this over. Got a little bit of a tear right there, but it's not going to matter because that still has to be, that nose has to be shaped. And that all looks pretty good. I could have liked to have gotten rid of a little bit of that flat spot, but I'm going to take that out with sandpaper. Okay, so this is a jig I made in order to shape that nose piece. Bearings on the bottom. Lock this in place. This is the, probably the one procedure where we have the most failure. It has a tendency to tear the wood. You've got all this time invested and this is where you possibly lose it. So I, I hold it like this and the bearing runs on this piece of steel underneath and shapes that nose. So what I'm going to do is go in and try to just ease away some of this on the side that it exits so that when I come around with one final pass there's not a lot of material there and it lessens the chance that I'm going to tear out fiber over here. comes the slow part. So this has to be in, has to be all sanded to finish. And I used to do it with a flap sander, but I didn't like the way it makes things kind of muddy. I like nice sharp edges. I used to cut this slot first, but what I found was in the sanding process, you would lose that nice crisp edge. And you want that to be sharp so that when it meets the brass, it's a nice tight fit. So I'm going to do all the sanding first and I'm gonna cut that slot out after the sanding is done and hopefully that'll preserve and give me that nice sharp edge right there. So I'm going to start this with uh, probably 150 grit. No, I, no, I'm going to do 120. There's just a little bit of tear right there. You can't see it but you can feel it. So better to start with a coarser grit and go. it'll go a lot faster. And the stuff I like, this has been sanded up to 320. It's, uh, it takes a long time because you've got to get in and around and just, I find it makes my fingers sore trying to get all that around there and get rid of that little flat spot. Uh, I'm gonna take it higher, but I'm gonna go do the rest of the machining. Cut, cutting the slot and then cutting the groove that goes down through here to hold the blade. That's good. Noisy. video we have more our monthly newsletter has subscriber only content discounts monthly on tools and anything we bring out that's new subscribers get first crack at it click on the link below let's get back to work okay so that slot is cut to hold a dovetail saw We've got the right depth now next move is to cut our slot down through here so the slot that runs down through here that will grab the bottom part of the blade has to be perfectly centered 
in this slot where the brass sits. And what we found that if you tried to do it with a bandsaw, it would sometimes wander. So we use a, uh, I think it's a three, no it's not, it's two and a half inch diameter slot cutting wheel, spinning in a drill press, just the right height, and somewhat of a dangerous operation, just because it has a tendency to grab, but get used to it. I just do it in multiple passes. I'll finish that with a handsaw. So the next process is more sanding. We're gonna, before I drill for the nuts and bolts, I want to go in and I want to uh, use a chisel to smooth these up. give you a smoother surface and you can get some sanding. What I'm going to do right now is I've got to go in I've got to define that edge because I've got to place my holes for the bolts and I have to know where the round meets meets the uh, flat so I get those properly placed. So I'm just going to I want to take off the lot just, just enough to find out where that line is. Now we can take that over to the drill press and bore two three sixteenths inch holes. what's called a split nut driver to install these and it's a bit nerve-wracking because you don't want to accidentally scrape the sides of that counter bore now I'm going to put a piece of quarter inch brass in there so that I don't squeeze those sides. Sand that brass flush so there's a little bit of material and I also have to take off the marks left by the the uh, depth gauge. So I'll start off with a little coarser grit. <laughs> What you have to be careful with on any kind of a sanding disc is all about rim speed. It doesn't move very fast there, it moves really fast out there. So it's going to be a lot more aggressive towards the outside. And I also want to use up the paper so I keep it moving. At the same time trying to apply the same amount of pressure everywhere. So that looks like All right, that's 600.
Okay, I'll leave these alone. Now, give that a good shot of compressed air. <laughs> so this is the part that is worth all the time and effort. You get to see it light up. I use a tongue oil product. I just uh, I like the way it goes on. It's probably going to take seven or eight coats and I, a day in between, so this is not a quick process. Now, I haven't cut that slot yet, but I'll do that prior to fitting the blade. A little bit tacky. I may put another coat on if it gets too tacky. You don't want to try to rub it, rub it off if it's too tacky. It just gets sticky. You can just wet it with more oil and it'll make it uh, workable. But uh, five or ten minutes of doing this and then wipe that coat off. Some woods, it, the wood, the oil continues to bleed out of the pores, which is bit of a pain because you've got to watch it for the next three or four hours or else you get little puddles of hardened oil which can be a real issue to deal with. This stuff I don't think is going to be bad. Okay so 10, actually probably 15 minutes of sitting on there and then getting wiped off. That's the first coat. One of about six or seven. It'll get a little more sheen, but that's that's what we're looking at. This is what I like. Nice crisp lines all along there. And these are just softened to the touch. That's going to make a gorgeous handle. Yet the now before we mount the blade, I've got to go in and sand the brass to get rid of these mill marks. I'll start off with a coarse grit and finish with a fine. Now before I switch grits, I've got to make sure that all those ripple marks from the router bit are gone. Now I can go to the fine grit. We have to do this before I be before we install the blade, otherwise it's too difficult to get in there next to the blade, but this part and the rest of it will be done after. Now, use Loctite, which sets up in the absence of air. And this is the wicking grade, which means it'll find its way down in there because two pieces make contact, meaning the blade and the brass. Just wait till that runs to the bottom. up. This is where we round over the end after it's been flushed up. Just put a little paper sleeve on there to protect the brass. 
It marks so easily. And then we'll finish that by hand. Okay, before I sand these, I want to protect the blade from getting scratched. Okay, so the last bit of sanding is just on the nose, and I've got 220 grit. And again, you're just getting rid of mill marks from the router. So you have to roll it as you do it. You're sanding a round surface with a flat surface. As soon as I can, there's a little, little mark left there. Just a bit of polish. All right, now that we'll clean up the blade with some some solvent, and then that will be ready to install as soon as the handle as the final coat of oil dry. Okay, you want a good tight fit. Good fit down there. Now we drill them. Okay, this, this is a 3 16 carbide tipped bit. Get that lined up. Now I like to put the first drill, or first uh, bolt in, so I know it's in the proper position before I drill the second one. I don't need to put the nut on; just hold that in place. Check for straight. No, well, that's one straight on. Okay, now final, final part is to test cut it. I'll grab a piece of lumber. This is a joinery cross cut. Cuts lovely. Now, Box it. We make these boxes here. Now, sign and date it. And find it a good home. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said better tools make the job so much easier. 
If you click on the plane and chisel icon below, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our in-person and online workshops.